for the remaining examples that I want to do for Monte Carlo simulations, I want to provide an alternative approach for setting up the simulations that will very often prove actually a bit more useful than this counter approach that was originally introduced. And if you remember the reason that we introduced the counter approach where we literally have a variable that counts up the number of times our event of interest occurs is because it's directly analogous to that frequentist definition of probability where we count up the number of times our event of interest occurred, divide that by the total number of trials that we've performed, we know that that fraction gets closer and closer and closer and closer to the true probability of that event occurring in the long run. But very often when we run a Monte Carlo simulation, we might be interested in estimating multiple probabilities. And we might actually be the most interested in keeping track of the result of every single outcome as we go from one trial to the next trial. And to illustrate that, let's revisit the stock out example problem. So in this case, what we're imagining is that there's some store that always starts out the week with 15 products in stock. So Monday morning, doors open, there's 15 of this item in stock. Random demands come in seven days a week. It's either one, two, or three with equal probability. And you were asked to estimate the probability that there would be at least one missed demand by the time that the restock happens. So does the total demand over seven days equal 16 or more? 16 would be one unmet demand, more would be at least one unmet demand here. And we did this with the counter approach where every time the sum of the daily demand over the course of the week exceeded 15, we bumped up the value of counter by one. And we saw that about 25% of weeks and therefore about a 25% probability uh, result in at least one missed demand. But what if we had a bigger question? What if we wanted to know, well, what's the probability that you know at least three of those items would still be in stock at the end of the week, or at least five? Or maybe the amount of missed demand was at least three or eight. We might have a lot of questions related to this inventory control policy. And so instead of just defining a counter to keep track of all the times very specific events of interest occur, sometimes, and actually really quite often, it makes a bit more sense to just record the results of every single trial. So after a week, realize and record that there were seven demands for the product coming in. The next week, maybe nine. The next week, maybe 18, then 17, then 10, then 11. If we store the total demand over the course of the week over, say, 50,000 different weeks, then we can go back and analyze those results at will. We can go back and look at the fraction of those weekly demands where we had at least one unmet demand. We can keep track of the fraction of weeks that had exactly eight demands come in. And so this is going to be all our alternative to the counter approach, actually just recording the result of each outcome during a Monte Carlo simulation, and then using those results to go back to answer lots of different questions about probabilities. And we'll use logical conditions and the mean function to help get us there. Now, I want to illustrate this just with an example, or a few examples here. So I'm not going to go with the slides all that much, We'll just head on over to our studio, and here's where I'd like to revisit the stock out problem and go over a few additional problems as well. So here's our question on inventory control. What we have is that a random amount of demand comes in each day, one, two, or three. So one, two, or three demand each day. And we know that there's always 15 in stock at the start of the week and the restock only happens on Sunday nights. So previously we answered the question, well, what's the probability that at least one unmet demand is experienced? We found that to be about 25%. What if we had additional questions and we just wanted to store the results of each trial as we went along? So here's what we're going to do. Same thing as with the counter approach. I'm going to go ahead and just define a variable called n trials to represent the total number of trials we want to use in the simulation. And then instead of left arrowing counter to be equal to zero, 
we're going to forego the counter entirely, and instead what I'm going to do is to define a variable to store the results of each trial of the Monte Carlo simulation. And in this case, since we're storing or keeping track of the weekly demand, I'm going to call this just weekly dot demand. And I'm going to initialize it to just be an empty vector. If we create a vector but then don't put anything inside the parentheses, when we define that you can see that in the global environment it's a null vector. So there's nothing in it, R is aware of its existence, and we're going to use that to store in the weekly demands as our simulation progresses. Otherwise, the approach is the same. We're going to set up our for loop saying, okay, let's say for trial in one to n trials here, we got some curly brackets, and inside the curly bracket, that is the engine behind the Monte Carlo simulation here. It conducts the trial. It looks to see what happened with it. This time, what we're going to do is store the weekly demand in the appropriate element of our weekly dot demand vector. So what we're going to do is calculate the total demand for that week. We're going to take the sum of taking a random sample of size 7 from the integers 1, 2, and 3, all equally likely, with replacement, of course. If I take the sum of the sample command, that'll tell me the total demand that came in over the course of the week. It's random here. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to store into a particular element of weekly demand my outcome of that trial, what that total demand was. So we know we refer to locations in a vector with a pair of square brackets. We just need to put something inside those square brackets to let it know what position inside the vector to place that value into. And if we just think out loud about what we need to have happen, the very first time that we go through the for loop, the very first trial, we want to put in as the first element of weekly demand the total demand observed that week. The second time through the loop, we want to put it into the second element. The third time through the loop, we're going to put it into the third element of weekly demand. Now, it just so happens that the name of our looping variable, trial in this case, is going to be perfectly suited to helping us out. Because the first time through the loop, trial is going to equal to 1. The second time through the loop, trial is going to equal to 2. So if we just put in trial in square brackets, this is going to automatically go through the first, second, third, fourth, fifth, etc. elements and assign those values appropriately. So if I were to run my for loop here, I see that weekly demand gets placed into the global environment. There's 10,000 total different elements. We could print them all out to the screen if we really wanted to. There's going to be too much to display. But here are the results of every single one of those trials. All right, so how can we use this to help answer questions about probability? Well, here's going to be a shortcut that I like. So let's answer the question, probability of at least one missed demand. And we talked about last time that in order to have at least one missed demand, in other words, the weekly demand has to be greater than 15 or greater than or equal to 16. Same way of writing that condition. So one thing we could do is to count up the number of trials where we have a weekly demand of that size. And we can always do that by combining the length and the which commands and specifying the condition on the elements that we're interested in. So in this case, if I say which weekly dot demand greater than or equal to 16, what I end up getting are the positions inside that vector that contain elements that are at least 16. And so if I put that inside a length function, that's going to count up how many elements there are. So this tells us the total number of weeks with unmet demand. And in this case, 2,465. The total number of trials that we ran was 10,000 n trials here. So this is the total number of weeks. And so the ratio between these two works out to be just about that 25% that we saw before.
Now, this is perfectly well and good, and feel free to write commands that look like this. So if we want to know the probability of at least one unmet demand, the probability that the total demand was 16 or larger, use length and width to count up the number of elements in that vector that we were using to store those weekly demands that exceeded 15, divided by the number of trials. But if you're like me and you like shortcuts, well, I have something for you. So let's use the mean function and the appropriate logical condition to calculate this instead. So what do I mean by this? Well, let me build this up in pieces. So what we're interested in kind of studying is when that total demand is 16 or larger or bigger than 15, however you want to write it. I'm just going to write out that logical condition and run that as a command. What if I were to say weekly.demand bigger than 15? Well, what that's going to do is it's going to print out a whole bunch of trues and falses according to whether or not the corresponding element of weekly demand was or wasn't bigger than 15. And to make that a little bit clear, let's just look at the first 10 elements of weekly.demand so you can see that it's doing its job. So the first one, two, three, uh, four weeks here, we have demands that are 13 and 14. They are not larger than 15, so we get falses. Then what we have are the following two elements are bigger than 15, so we get trues. And then the rest of the elements are not bigger than 15, and so we get falses for the rest of these. And this is the great thing about R, is that in R, the number or the value true the logical condition true is equivalent to the number one. So I could do something like true plus true plus false. False is going to be the number zero. And it knows, okay, we'll convert trues to ones and falses to zero. So I can actually do algebra on the results of running a logical condition. So if I wanted to know, well, how many elements of weekly dot demand were bigger than 15, I could take the sum of this vector. There's that 2465 that we saw before. That's essentially taking the sum of a whole bunch of ones and zeros, the trues and falses, giving us the total number of elements of weekly dot demand that exceed 15. And if we divide it by n trials, well, we'll recover our same answer, 0.2465. But what we can do is make this even shorter by instead taking the sum of this, instead of taking the sum, take the average value. Because what's the average? Well, you sum up all of the values of some elements in a list, divide by the number of elements there are. That's exactly what we're doing here. N trials was 10,000, the number of elements in weekly.demand. So mean tells us the fraction of elements that exceed 15. Well, the fraction in the long run where we see elements bigger than 15, that's a good guess of what that probability of exceeding 15 is. And so here is what I'm trying to get at with taking the average value, the mean, of some logical condition. You want to know the probability that the uh, demand exceeds 15? We get at least one unmet demand. Well, take the mean of the appropriate logical condition. All right, well, let's estimate the probability that the weekly demand is exactly 17. Well. Here's the nice thing when we don't use the counter approach, if we've stored the total demand in our weekly.demand vector, we don't have to run the simulation again. We don't have to create a different counter for this particular event. We already have the results of that simulation. So if I wanted to know the probability that the weekly demand is exactly 17, I can just take the average of my logical condition that describes that event. So the mean of weekly.demand double equals 17 looks like about 7.5 percent. All right, well, estimate the probability that the demand is 13 or fewer. In other words, at least two items are still in stock. You can probably anticipate where this is going. All right, we just take the mean of the logical condition that interests us. We want to know, well, when is the weekly demand 13 or fewer? So less than or equal to 13 and we get about 41%.
And so unless you're writing your simulation as a one-off, you have one particular question that you would like to answer about your random process, I feel that typically it is in your best interest, instead of doing the counter approach, to define some sort of vector that's going to record the key outcome of each different trial. Because then getting those estimated probabilities is just as easy as taking the average of some logical condition. All right, let's do another problem. Let me switch back to the notes really quickly because this one is coded into the notes. I'm going to look at a classic problem in probability that is about name tags. So let's imagine that 20 people tape, take their name tags. You know, as MBA, MSBA students, you guys sometimes put your name tags on the uh, on the. Uh, tables that you're sitting at, maybe not with COVID all around, but in the old old days, BC, uh, before coronavirus is what we did. So let's imagine 20 of you took your name tags and we put them all into a bag. We got to shuffle them all up and then we distribute them back to the people at random. So each person gets a random name tag. We might like to know what's the probability that at least five of the people end up with their correct tags. Or and why stop there? Maybe exactly one, or maybe no one, or maybe at least three. There's a lot of questions potentially we could answer about this random process. And so there's a motivation for storing the results of each one of the trials that we're going to run in the Monte Carlo simulation. So name tag matching. So we have 20 people get name tags at random. And we're going to figure out something about the number of people who end up with their correct name tags. All right, so all Monte Carlo simulations are just a thinking challenge. How are you gonna set up your computer code so that it is able to simulate that random process and then measure what you wanted to measure? So in this case, what I'm going to do is think out loud and try to construct this sample command. Sample allows us to potentially randomly assign name tags to different people. We just got to figure out the logic. So what if I did sample 1 colon 20, the integer sequence 1, 2, 3, all the way up to 20. I said size equal to 20 and replace equals false. Well, in effect, this is getting just a random reordering of the numbers 1 through 20, kind of a random permutation of the numbers 1 through 20. And so why don't we take this to be who got what name tag? So in this case, person 1 received name tag 15, person 2 received name tag 8, person 3 received name tag 1. Not a lot of matches here. And so why don't we kind of build off of that? So this will represent who got what name tag. So first element is what person number one received. So I need to figure out the number of matches. Well, we've already been talking about logical conditions, so here's actually a great place to do another logical condition here. What if I said so I'm going to left arrow this into a vector called tags here. So here's what I got. What if I said tags double equal to 1 colon 20? Well, what that's going to do is it's going to check to see, well, is the first element of tags equal to the first element of this vector here on the right, equal to 1? If so, I get a true back, otherwise I get a false. And then it does the same thing for the second, the third, the fourth, the fifth, etc. elements. So if I look at the results of running this, I see a whole bunch of falses. So it looks like no one actually got their correct name tag. What if I did some of this logical condition? That would tell me the total number of people that got their correct name tags. And so in this case, zero. Let's regenerate that random assignment of name tags. Okay, well, we got two there. Let's kind of see who got the name tags assigned correctly. We have person number 18 and person number four. So is that correct? Yes, the fourth element is four. The 18th element is 18. So sometimes people get their correct name tags. Other times they don't. 
But this is essentially what I want to be recording as I go from one trial to the next. Each trial will be a random permutation, a random assignment of name tag tags to people. Some of tags double equal one colon 20 will let me know the total number of people that got their correct name tags. So let's set up the Monte Carlo simulation. Once again, I'm going to define n trials to be 10,000, just because I like 10,000. And then what I'm going to do is create a vector to store the results, the outcomes of each trial here. And so it makes sense to me to call this just num.correct. And I'm going to initialize that to be just an empty vector. And then I can write my for loop. So for trial and one, two, n trials, what do we need to do? Well, we need to randomly reassign those name tags back to people. And then what we're going to do is we're going to keep track of the number of people that got the correct name tag in each one of those trials. All right, so we already have n trials defined. I'm going to run this code so that it makes an error just so that I can show something that you're going to want to remind yourself every time you approach Monte Carlo simulation in this way. So I'm going to omit this num.correct, initializing it to be an empty vector. I'm going to forget to do that and run the for loop. If I do this, notice that I get an error. It says num.correct not found. And so here's one thing to remember about how R works. This is something that differs from one programming language to another. But in R, you cannot put an element inside of a vector unless that vector already exists in the global environment. So if I were to say num correct right now, that object doesn't exist, I get an error. Normally, if I were to say, all right, num correct equals to five, Sure, that runs no problem. I see num.correct is equal to five. Let me actually remove that from the environment really quickly. Notice though that if I say num.correct bracket one, let's put into the first element of num.correct the number five, this command will fail. And that's because num.correct doesn't exist in the global environment right now. And so I cannot put anything into it unless R is aware of its existence. So how do we fix this? Well, as soon as we run the command num.correct left arrow an empty vector, it exists in the global environment. So now I'm actually able to put elements inside of it. That command runs just fine. All right, so let's get to our answer. Monte Carlo simulation ran really quickly. We can get an overview of what values resulted from each trial here. How often do we get people with the correct name tags? And it looks like it's fairly rare for a lot of people to get the correct name tags. A lot of times it's zero, a lot of times it's one, two, three, four, five, six, progressively rarer. So, all right, how can I answer some probabilities here? What's the probability that no one gets their correct name tag? Now, we know the answer here. We already looked at the number of zeros. There were 3,648 instances out of those 10,000 trials where no one got their correct name tag, so just about 37%. Let's use the mean of the logical condition to answer this. What's the mean of the logical condition num.correct double equals zero? What fraction of elements of num.correct equals zero? That fraction is going to be a good guess of the probability. That's going to be our 36.48%. So what's the probability that at least three people get their correct name tag? And I don't know if you've noticed this, but as I've been kind of talking, I have a weird Seattle accent. I didn't realize that people from Seattle have an accent until I went to college. But whenever there's an AG, I kind of pronounce that a little bit funny. So most people across the US, if they're going to pronounce the word tag, say the word tag, kind of like what I'm doing right now. Um, I, however, like to say, or kind of ingrained in my head, to say it tag instead. So for me, it's a constant struggle whenever I run into a word that has an A-G in it. I would like to say name tag, dragon, bag, 
Stuff like that. You have also might have heard that in the movie Fargo, kind of shares the same sort of speech pattern as people in uh, like Minnesota, North Dakota, etc. here. So I might mess that up every now and then. I still have to think about it consciously every time I run into a word like this. Um, so that's kind of why I tripped up a little bit over saying those words. But anyway, back to the problem at hand. What's the probability that at least three people get the correct name tag? How do we set up that logical condition? Well, we just ask num.correct greater than or equal to three. So about a 9% chance or so. And you know what's great about this simulation is that it's pretty easily generalizable if we wanted to extend it to a different scenario. So if instead of say 20 people that were going to participate in the simulation, what if we said num.people was 100, let's define a variable to store the number of people in the simulation. Notice that if we just replace these 20s, we've now made our simulation perfectly generalizable to any number of people we might want to look at. The only thing we'd have to change is this single value. So I'm curious. I want to know, all right, if we have 100 people, we switch up all their name tags and uh, kind of put them back at random. How often do we get correct values or correct assignments? It looks like it's actually pretty close to where it used to be here. So one last thing, one last question. What's the average number of people that get their correct name tag? Well, if we just take the mean of num correct itself, that's going to give us the average value inside of a vector. That's going to be the average number of people that end up getting their correct tag, and it looks like it's right at about one. And if you actually sit down and do the math, and we'll talk about how to calculate expected values, average values from probability distributions at a later time, you can actually prove that on average, exactly one person, no matter how many people there are in the room, end up with their correct tag. All right, so one last problem that I want to deal with has to do with M&Ms. You know, me and my sweet tooth, I want to nom 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 on all the M&Ms here. I want to look at something that I've had in the back of my mind for a little while. So I've written some additional code, and what this code does, it essentially opens up a pack of M&Ms with this number of M&Ms in it. So 49 in this case, I'm programming it so that it needs to be a square number so the plot comes out nice. And so let me run the set of code. So here's a visual demonstration of opening up a pack of 49 M&Ms. We see a good mix of colors. I could open up another. And so now, you know, we have invented kinetic art. So kinetic art kind of changes its form as time goes on, as your angle changes. You know, we could be a multi-million dollar artist if we put this into a museum now. Kind of a lot of artists do kind of crazy artworks like that. It's probably been done, um, so you're not going to make a million dollars with it, but kind of a nice thought. So one question I could answer about the pack of M&Ms is something about the color distribution. So I might be interested in knowing, well, all right, how many of each color do I end up getting from these M&Ms? You know, do I get a virtual tie? You know, are they more or less balanced? Do I miss a color completely? And so let's talk about that question. What I'm going to do is I'm interested in knowing the number of unique colors that I might get when I open up this pack of M&Ms. So what's the, what's the deal, what's the T on the number of unique colors we get when we open up a pack? All right, so in this case, I've already done most of the heavy lifting here with the code. We need to write some sort of line of code that simulates opening up a pack. And in this case, I'm going to define n to be 49 down here. We have 49 M&Ms. We're sampling from these colors right here, just the text colors, and we're doing it with replacement size equal to n, 49. So if I say color choice, I could look at a table of this. And I see that all of them are nice and evenly represented here. 
Uh, so remember our discussion about table beforehand. When we run table, we actually get a named vector, meaning that we get a vector of numbers out, these numbers that we see right here. So we get a vector of length 6, but each element of this vector has a name assigned to it. Just like how columns of a data frame have names, elements of a vector can have names as well. The first element of the result of running table color choice has the name blue. The second has a name brown. In fact, we can actually extract those names directly with the names command. And it's just a nice way to kind of represent the whole story with the frequencies that we see in this vector. We see blue nine times, green eight times, etc. But the nice thing is, is that since the result of running table is a numeric vector, we can run stuff like sum, mean, length, max, etc. on it. So we can start doing calculations. And so one thing I might want to look at is the length command associated with table of color choice. What does length do? Well, it counts up the total number of elements inside that vector. So if I measure length table color choice, I'm going to get six because all colors were represented. So this is something that I could store from one trial to another. Every time I open up a pack of M&Ms, let's keep track of the number of unique colors that I see there. Another way to do that is to actually run the command unique on color choice that would actually go through this vector and tell you all of the unique elements that exist in there. I could see length of unique as well. There's six different ones. Many different paths to the same uh, final destination here. Okay, so let's go ahead and write that simulation. Let's do a bunch of trials here. Let's mix it up and do 50,000. We'll live a little bit. And what we'll do is we'll define a vector called num colors. We'll define that to be just an empty vector at first. The for loop will fill in the elements one by one as we run through it. And now for trial in one to n trials, inside the curly brackets, that's where we're going to write our code that conducts the trial, does that simulation, and keeps track of the number of unique colors here. So how do we open up a pack? Well, here's our line of code. We sample from these six values, these six colors, total of 49 times with replacement. And then what we're going to do is we're going to store into the appropriate element of num colors, the result of running length table color choice or length unique color choice. It's up to you. So as I do this, well, let's uh, make sure we don't have typos. What's the error here? It says trials isn't found. Well, that's just because I put an extra S right there. So 50,000 different packs of M&Ms here. <laughs> Maybe I was a little bit too ambitious with the uh, 50,000 there, but we got it done. And so now we can look at some of the results. Let's just see how often we see different numbers of colors here. You know, almost every single instance, we end up with all six colors. There were 37 times out of those 50,000 where we were missing a color. So, all right, very, very rare that we don't get full representation. But maybe the packs are a little bit smaller. Instead of 49, you know, if you go trick-or-treating on Halloween, uh, the fun packs usually only have you know, maybe 25 or so M&Ms in there. So let's rerun that simulation. We'll have a higher chance of missing a color now since we only have 25 different candies. And so we can go and open up 50,000 of these fun packs. And so now we see that sometimes we're actually missing two colors here. If we wanted to know what's the probability we miss at least one color, that's going to be the uh, probability that the number of colors is less than or equal to five. This is what I wish I had spell check here. So we can ask for the mean of that logical condition. Num.color stores the number of different colors we saw in each one of our trials. So we find that there's about a 6% chance of missing at least one color. Now I want to add one additional twist on here just to show you how powerful Monte Carlo simulation is. I know you've already bought into it. You love Monte Carlo simulation. It's really the, the next best thing here. Technically, if you are really, really good at math and really good at the laws of probability, you could come up with the exact answer to this without running a Monte Carlo simulation. 
if you're really, really good at probability, you could do this. But I'm going to throw a wrench in that. That makes the problem completely impossible to solve, well, without it being extraordinarily tedious. And that is, fun the fact, that when you open up one of those fun packs of M&Ms, you don't always get the same number of candies. Sometimes you get 25, sometimes you get a little bit less, sometimes you get a little bit more. Believe me, I've opened up a lot of M&M fun packs. Unfortunately, the number of M&Ms is going to vary from one pack to another. So I'm going to add an additional layer of sophistication to the Monte Carlo simulation. So what if the number of M&Ms in a pack is random? What if it's anywhere from 18, kind of a very anemic pack, up to 27, a pretty beefy pack here? Then I might want to know, OK, well, does that change my answer much? We have about a 6% chance of missing at least one color if there's always 25 M&Ms in there. Well, what if the number of M&Ms is variable? This is very often what we do in Monte Carlo simulation. We end up just making the uh, simulation a little bit more sophisticated each time. And so let's borrow from what we have and adapt this. So instead of always being 25, we really need to sample from 18 up to 27. We just need one. Don't need with a rip that replacement here. And I need that to happen inside the for loop. Because for each trial, I want to sample a different number of M&Ms. That's all I needed to do. That's the one line of code that I pretty much had to change in order to add that extra layer of sophistication. This would have added hours and hours and hours if you were going to actually do this just by hand. But now, all of the number of M&Ms in the packs are going to vary randomly from one pack to another. And I'm curious to know, is this probability going to be different at all? So let's see, it used to be 6%. Now it's actually a bit about more than doubled here. And that's probably due to the fact that sometimes it's hardly going to have any M&Ms and a higher chance of it missing at least one color. But there we go. Monte Carlo simulation, absolutely amazing. So, hey, Jackson. Jackson, with me. Or Cannon, one Frenchie. Come on. Come on. You want to be part of the video? Cannon, Cannon, let's go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, big Frenchie. Big Frenchie. Hi, everybody. Monte Carlo simulation is awesome. I like it more than peanut butter. Thanks, Cannon. <laughs>